are we live yes we're live and it's jeff kravitz welcome to 420 live friday edition our fifth show of the week this is i know i'm fully out of summer when i stopped skipping shows because i was enjoying my summer so the first time since i believe the end of july that we went that we've gone live for you uh five days a week and uh yesterday if you tuned in to the show you heard the history of reggae music from Wayne Jobs and Native Wayne. He told, he, I mean, so many stories came out of him. I'm gonna, have, we're having a hard time. Uh, Matt Bavuso, who who uh, does all the clips for the show, and Jeff Waffle, who puts it together for Jefferson Waffle, who cuts it, are having a hard time figuring out what the best story was yesterday. We might have to do just a whole minute clip on the things that Wayne talked about because he really knows. He was there. He saw it. He, you know, his first row seat to watching the history of reggae and watching Bob Marley in the studio, working with Toots, Peter Tosh, Jimmy Cliff. I mean, you know, every legend there is. And we all know how much we love reggae and how important it is to us. The other big auspicious thing today, it is the Jewish New Year, 5781. Happy New Year, everyone out there. Lashana Tova on Rosh Hashanah. It is written on Yom Kippur. It is sealed. So we have a lot that we want to put behind us. Last year was a very trying year. I don't want to say it started back in the fall. Actually, fall and the beginning of winter were actually pretty good. Uh, but everything hit uh, went to hell in the bucket when uh, March hit, February, March. And uh, we haven't been the same since. We are in the upside down, the topsy-turvy. We're living on the other side of reality, the way it feels like when you go out, everybody's wearing a mask on the streets. And uh, you, know, you sit down to eat and you get to take your mask off and sit there with your friends. But we don't know what's going on. Numbers going up in certain places. Madrid is having a hard problem. Europe right now, Israel is ready to shut down again. You know, the world is not the uh, carefree, not that it was carefree before, but you realize how easy we had it before where we could jump on a plane at will and decide to go spend the weekend in Vegas and go out all night to nightclubs and New York City. You could go get a deli sandwich at four o'clock in the morning or some Chinese food or even walk into a bodega and a lot of bodega bodega a bodega and get some uh, snacks late at night and when i was there some of the bodegas were closed that used to be open 24 hours the city that never sleeps taking a little nap a little snoozer right now uh you know and i'm sure everybody there is concerned about what's going to happen in the winter as we all are so as we prepare ourselves as you know this 420 live has become a place of distraction a place where i like to come to get away from it for an hour to uh, turn my back on what's happening and enlighten you guys and myself to what various friends of mine have been up to during this entire pandemic. And we've been really, really lucky with the amount of people. We've had 135 shows, which is absolutely incredible. It's been six months this week. Was our This was our sixth month of doing this and six months in this pandemic also on the uh, 16th, if you line it up, March 16th to September 16th. That's your six months right there. So we're all finding a, a new reality, a new way to survive in this. I myself, uh, I'm not, this isn't a, a financial survival here, but it is a mental survival. And I think that's the most important thing is I'm keeping myself engaged by coming to you guys and, and reaching out to various people that have touched my lives that I've met over the years and being able to show their side of the story. You know, uh, it's, uh, interesting the people that want to talk and it's also the people interesting the people that don't want to talk but i've really kept it in the entertainment realm and uh i'm not going to go far from the usual distraction but today we are lucky to have noel castler on the show noel worked with uh our president in various capacities we're on the celebrity apprentice and with some of his uh beauty pageants and uh you know he's been uh, all over the twitter but as soon as i post on twitter people my friends are like i follow this guy i follow this guy and i went on his twitter and it's it blows up he's on there relentlessly he's become a freedom fighter he's taken it upon himself to use his comedy and his uh, talent to communicate to be able to, to say what happened in front of his own two eyes while he was working with our president so i've really been looking forward to this because i don't want to get into politics but I don't think there's any time more important than right now for us to spend a little bit of time each week focusing on the uh, comedian in charge. So without further ado, Noel Kassler, welcome to 420 Live. How are you? Right on, Jeff. Good to be here, man. Thanks for having me. How's it going? 
it's going well, you know, and uh, I'm up here in the country. I live on the Upper East Side. I left on this March 16th. You know, we came up here to this place we have in the country and you're right, things have changed. So I do want to applaud you for doing this show because it's been a distraction for me too. You know, we know a lot of people in common from the TV and music world. It's been good to see them on this show and to talk about arts and music, you know, in addition to what, what we have going on now. Yeah, it, it, our world got so much more serious. I know, I know. It's like, it's because well, you know, because our world shut down. You know, we're, there's no concerts. We didn't. You know, we're not at Rock Hall where I would normally see you everywhere. You know, we're not like the VMAs happened, but not like it did in all the you know decades that you and I have done it. And it is serious because we're in a life or death struggle. You know. No, oh, no, I know. I see it all the time. And it's just absolutely mind boggling what we're going through. And, uh, you know, it, it just seems like everything you see on news is so inflammatory. Everything being thrown at you is just to so take you out of your game. It's like you wake up in the morning and there's some something that's being attacked that you didn't even think was attackable. Exactly. You can't even keep up with the bad news. I mean, look, this week, this the, the sky just cleared above us, you know, and my heart goes out to all you guys with those fires. But we were under a haze for four days. I'm 50 miles from New York City and New York City itself, like four, four and a half days of like you couldn't even see the sun. And, and, and from us, right, because of our fires. Because of your fires. And I'm like, that's insane. You know, when in our history of fires on the West Coast caused, you know, blocked out the sun on the East Coast, you know, well, and that's where we're at. You know, we're in a like an existential threat. And like, you know, thanks for mentioning my Twitter. And I am on there relentlessly, but it's not because I want to be, you know, as you know, I was a music guy. I worked with entertainers. I did Celebrity Apprentice because I was brought in to handle the celebs. You know, I was brought in to take care of like, you know, you know, Cindy, whatever, she's a friend of mine. I think, you know, girls just want to have fun or whatever. Right, you know? Cindy Lauper. So well, let, let, let's go let, Let's go back to kind of like how you got into this. When you were born and raised in New York City or was yeah, that where you in Westchester, just outside of the city where I am now, yeah. And you wanted to be in the entertainment industry? Was that your thing? Yeah, it was my, I was music. You know, I grew up listening to music and, uh, you know, bands that I ended up working for as an adult, Crosby, Stills and Nash and Jackson Brown. And, you know, when I, and I was a deadhead, I was a big deadhead. This is the late eighties, I graduated 89. And when I was in high school, uh, I got a ticket to go see Jackson, Jackson Brown at Radio City Music Hall. And I snuck in the side door. Like I didn't, you know, the, by the carriage door, the stage entrance. I know where it is. Right. Like, I didn't even know what I was doing. And I walk in the like stage door. This is in the 80s. Like there was different security. Nobody cared. I get past the guard. I get in an elevator. I press a button. I get off on the floor of the dressing rooms. And by dumb luck, I end up in Jackson Brown's dressing room. You know, and I met him and started talking music and politics with him. And he took a liking to me. And basically, we developed a friendship from then on, you know, from there on out. And I ended up working on the Kennedy Center Honors and TV, you know, when I was 21, 22. I got in that world and I stayed. I'm 49 now. You know, I did it for 25 years. Ooh, explain to everybody what a talent wrangler's job is. OK, so, you know, people, when they watch shows, you know, you see the people on stage, you know, but there's a whole department of people that are in charge from of them from the time they pull up outside the event. Like one of the last times I saw you was outside Rock Hall when we were doing it in Cleveland, you know, and I got a call like, hey, you got to be there with a wheelchair in case uh, the killer, you know, what's his name? Oh, Jerry Lee Lewis. Lewis. They're like, come there with a wheelchair in case Jerry Lee Lewis needs it. So I'm on the red carpet, you know. He gets out, sees me with a wheelchair, starts swinging his cane at me. You know, he got mad because it made him look old, you know. Right. Yeah, John Silva was on the ground laughing, you know. It was so funny. But anyway, so but you're, you're there to greet them from when they show up at the event, take them to their dressing room, deal with their management, you know, let the producers and directors know they're there. And then your main responsibility is to deliver them to the DGA stage managers, you know, the people we all know that are on the side of the stage because they have to stay on the side of the stage and they're on PL with the director. So there's a whole team of people running around behind the scenes. And that sounds easy, but it's not, you know, because you have to be very diplomatic and you have to sort of keep your mouth shut and be very calm. And the benefit of that is they think you're kind of nobody and you're sort of there because the people who actually run the show, the directors and producers, they don't want to have their face involved if it goes wrong. You know, if Madonna's unhappy and like and things start flying, 
they don't want to be there because they have to work with them in six months on the Grammys. You so know? do you take that heat when something yeah. goes wrong? Absolutely. You always take that heat. You're kind of the fall guy for that. You know, because well, you're the conduit between them and the producer. Exactly. Exactly. You're like the mercenary, you know, and, and there's a whole team of people that do that. And I was in that world and you know, a lot of those guys, you know, and yeah. we go from show to show. We're never really part of the show. We're not in the credits. You know, we're not there for six weeks. We get there about two hours before, you well, about the, about a day before the talent starts arriving. You know, and we map out the routes. And another thing we do is if, if your viewers are watching a show and they see like, you know, John Legend sitting in the audience and then a half an hour later, they see him giving out an award or performing. We're the guys that do those polls. Those are called talent polls. So it sounds easy, but there's a heck of a lot of coordination involved and it. it all has to go well, you know. And, and then you're subject to their whims too, whatever the talent wants at that moment. All that, you know, and I did, I was doing difficult talent. I did Michael Jackson, you know, at the VMAs and the Rock Hall, Madonna, you know, a lot of your iconic photographs, you know, Britney Spears when she had that snake on. I didn't know she, the snake was there. I brought her to the stage. She walked with Justin Timberlake. I bring her right to the stage. All of a sudden, this dude opens a box and comes out with his python. <laughs> oh, my God. But, uh, yeah, you're subject to their whims, you know. And But here, the other thing is they don't know you're paying attention. You know, and that's where the Trump stuff came in because he would snort, you know, he'd be snorting this stuff in his dressing room, you know, and he'd come out and it'd be flicking, flying out of his nose. It'd fly out on set. And they sort of think like, this guy doesn't care. You know what I mean? He's kind of a, his own case. Like he just does. He doesn't think anybody cares. I mean, he had it flying out of his nose at a press conference last week. I but, saw that. I, I kept running that video back and forth like it was a fucking Zapruder film. Right. And that's not the first time it happened at a, at a table, like uh, kind of read with Pence or something, you know, last year or a year before that would happen all the time. They would send in HMU to clean him up and stuff. But my point is they don't, you know, the, the talent will let their guard around you down around you. Cause they see you, you're just kind of the guy standing outside the door and they think you're not really listening and you're not paying attention. And of course you are, at least I was, you know, of I paid course. Attention. The whole time. Also, because I was interested, you know, with artists, I wanted to see how it worked. It was awesome to be a fly in the in the room. You know, when I was with Springsteen and all these people, I'm like, this is the greatest. I got my job touring with Crosby, Stills and Nash at the big Rock Hall 25th anniversary. You remember those concerts at the Garden? Yeah, sure. We rehearsed at SIR, you know, and our set was like Bonnie Raitt, you know, Jackson Brown, all these guys and we're in like Springsteen's in the room next door at SIR, the one on 23rd or whatever, you know, and Paul Simon's down the hall and I'm just standing there up against the wall. And their manager was like, man, you know how to disappear in a crowd, don't you? And I was like, yep. Cause that's the gig. You, you want to like fit in and be unobtrusive. And if somebody needs something, you're there to help, you know? And I took, if you need a sandwich or a light for your cigarette or something, I took that as like my role, you know, like that's my contribution to the music. And I took it seriously as you have to. And I became a road manager and toured the world, you know, several times because that's your part. You know, that's the part you play. All right. So what, what is, what was it like? Like Trump, let's face it. In those days, he didn't think he was going to be president. Wow. You didn't think he was going to be president. Nobody thought he was going to be president. And I even think up to the election, he didn't think he was going to be president. He definitely didn't. If you saw him on election night, he was scared. He looked shell-shocked. When he walked out, he was at the New York Hilton. When he walked out there, he looked like, oh, my God, I didn't think it was going to go this far. He wanted to, like, get his own Fox News kind of network. You know, he wanted to parlay the fame into something big. In the money. In the money. It was money. Yeah, it was money. Right. And, and especially back then, like I did the Celebrity Apprentice. My friends did the Apprentice Apprentice, you know, and when they showed up to start filming that, they had to rent furniture for his office because his, his real furniture was so threadbare and beaten down. Like Mark Burnett and those guys were like, no one's going to believe you're a billionaire. Like they had to go out and rent furniture to make him look legit because people think it was like a big multinational corporation. There's like 12 people that work in his office. Like it's a small real estate office. You know, it's not a big multinational corporation. It's, it's like a couple of, you know, dozen people. So, so when we did Celebrity Apprentice, a friend of mine who you probably even know, who was a talent coordinator and, you know, we do, we do like A gigs and B gigs. 
gigs, you know, and I would see you on the big gigs, the Grammys, you know, the stuff, but the bread and butter in Manhattan is you're doing these little cooking shows on, you know, or whatever, a reality show comes to town. So that came to town and it was like the first season we did, it was shot at 8H at SNL, you know, at Rock Center. Mm -hmm. My friend got the gig and she's like, hey, I need kind of an A-team of talent handlers. It's going to be a pretty easy day. It's pretty good rate. You know, there's a big party down on the, on the rink, you know, on the ice rink after you're all invited, which is rare, as you know. You don't always get invited to the party. At least I don't. And uh, Jeff always does. But, uh, <laughs> I just work my way in. That's where I met you. I met you at the Rock Hole party for the first at, time. At the Waldo, at, at the after parties. It was me, you, and Kid Rock in a corner in like the late 90s. <laughs> and uh, anyway, I won't tell that story. But anyway, <laughs> <friend> is like, <laughs> she's well, like, that's why Kid Rock stole my pipe. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Fucker. Yeah. So he was just about him. You know, he was like, you know, anyway, I digress. But There's anyway, a nice fucking pipe, too. Exactly. <laughs> well, that's, that's kid, you know. But uh, so she was like, come on down and do it. I need some decent handlers. We had, as I said, we had like, in the beginning, we had musical talent. It was kind of more of a variety show. And uh, I went down and did it on a lark, and that's when it just got crazy. But but nobody knew he was going to be president, and it 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 got it was popular. So I would do it every year before I'd go out on the road with a band because we would do the finale in like May. You know, we did it eight age, then we did it Skirball down at NYU, and then we ended up at the Museum of Natural History. And the last three years, I took care of Ivanka and Jared, and that's when it started getting like crazy. You know, like. You didn't know he's become president, but you knew that that was a seriously dysfunctional thing. And I could see her running the show behind the scenes. You know, you could see the ambition and the weird sort of arrangement they had. And uh, you mean father daughter? Yeah. Well, because she manipulates him. You know, her real speaking voice isn't that whispery sibilant S thing. You know, she plays up when when she's going to like talk to him. She does this Marilyn Monroe kind of like manipulative kind of coy thing. And then the behind the scenes, you know, her voice is like an octave lower and she's cursing and stuff like that. <laughs> and, and, you know, he, I tell people this, like when, Oh, wait, Oh, wait, oh, what's that? Did this just come up? No, is that no. true? I wonder if that's true. Is that true? Anybody can confirm that that's watching. Go ahead. No, yeah, that just shocked me. True. If that's true, we just ended up in a very crucial moment in American history, man. But uh, I'll just I'll just keep going. Uh, Go ahead. Um, so anyway, you know, I tell people this: Trump, like Trump's a narcissist. You know, he's only interested in how he can feed his ego in that moment. Like Trump wants to, music to play when he walks in the room. He wants to get high and he wants to hit on chicks. You know, like that's all he's thinking about. He would have like hell's angels come to the after party and stuff. Like it was like. He wanted to be like the big tough guy and the big famous guy in the room and, and have men and women sort of look up to him. Ivanka and Jared kind of had a more of a long game plan. You know, they wanted to kind of run the show. And we would have like, you know, Felix Sater work for them. I don't know how deep in the weeds you want to get with the Russia stuff, but like the invited audience was like all Russian, like rich dudes, <laughs> you know, like Russian dudes and their wives in furs in like May. You know, and the after party would be at like Trump Soho, you know, and Jared and Ivanka would be working the room with Felix meeting all these Russians, you know, and Trump would just be like, are the chicks checking me out? You know, he would wait in the hallway for like everybody to arrive at the party and then he'd try to walk in with his security guys yeah, around. Yeah, but it's, it's something he's been doing all his life. Exactly. You know? yeah, exactly. It's, it's, I, mean, I do that myself. Exactly. He, he would walk around like he was president back then. Like that's what he wants. He wants the pomp and circumstance. He's not interested in governing or the job, you know? And, and the problem with that is what we now face. Like you have a guy who's completely unequipped to deal with a very complex, rapidly changing world. And he can only think about himself and how he can sort of stay in that position. Hey, no, let, let's check Joe, this out right now. You know, this is, you know, she is the justice Americans know. Right. She's the one who could go by RBG. She's the one who had that famous friendship. Um, this is you know, unbelievable. Across the aisle. She had become something much bigger even than just a Supreme Court justice. 
That's exactly right. She had an iconic stature as the notorious RBD, yeah. someone who had well, who stood for women's equal rights, who early on was one of only nine women in her law school class at Harvard, went on to... Well, the news is up, everybody. You know, I'm sure everybody's checking it out or they're checking us out. Um, this is the first time something like this has happened in 136 shows. And it's really something unbelievably important. It couldn't be more important. That right there is one of the most important things that has happened in our lifetimes politically. You know, so you, here's the question. You know, they gave uh, Obama so much shit, wouldn't let him pick a guy for nine months, 10 months. Do you think with uh, eight weeks left? He already eight, said he would. He already said he would, Jeff. And maybe it wasn't by coincidence that Trump just announced 20 candidates last week for the Supreme Court, including Ted Cruz. You know, <laughs> so, yeah. you know, he they might have known something we didn't. Um, it's just earth shattering. And. You know, Mitch already said he'd, he'd jam one through. And Mitch got six judges appointed to the federal judiciary this week within 30 hours. He didn't get well, any it. Does it have to pass the House and the Senate? No. Once it goes to the Senate, it's they're they're confirmed. If they're confirmed right. in the Senate, they're confirmed. And that and he in 30 hours on Monday and Tuesday, he got six dudes lifetime appointments on the federal bench. He wasn't able to get another stimulus check for you and I and all of our friends and Brody's who haven't worked in eight months. You know, he wasn't able to do any of that other business, but they were able to get those judges through. And I'll, I'll say one other thing today in a Trump's press conference, he said, it's going to be up to the judges. We're, we are counting on the federal judges. And he said that in reference to a vote count, you know, to, to sort of disenfranchising mail-in ballots. Yeah, so well, he's been you working on the campaign. That's been a thing for him now. That's the, that's the whole rub, right? That's working it. Because he knows. Did you saw what happened in Virginia today, right? Exactly. Yep. Exactly. I could, not, he, I could not believe the line of voters for early voting. There had to be a thousand people, if not more, in that line. You're absolutely right. And you know what? This will galvanize people even more. You know, her passing away and God rest her soul. You know, because she's an incredible woman an American hero in every aspect, regardless of what your politics are, watch the notorious RBG. I mean, she's brilliant and was yeah. brilliant at a time when women weren't allowed to excel at brilliance, you know, and she did it anyway. But uh, I think hopefully the good news of that is like to honor her. I think the lines are going to be insane, you know, in six weeks from now, but it also, you know, it's not going to, it, you know, it's cataclysmic in terms of if they could rush somebody through the Supreme Court. But yeah, I, think, I, I would I would think it's going to be the biggest uh, attempt ever to try to make them wait until after the election. You know, I mean, they everybody knows what's at stake. I mean, I don't know what we could do, but man, I don't know how, you know, it was amazing how they jacked Obama up. You know, no, I mean, I, we need to get rid of him more than ever now. I mean, I just feel that. I mean, you never thought he should be president. I never thought he should be president because I knew what he did to Atlantic City. And I knew what he did to all these uh, old school businesses that have been in, in, in town for, for generations and how he just went in and bankrupt these people and didn't care. You know, he just cares about himself. Exactly. I, feel, I always forget you're from Jersey. So, you know, exactly. I mean, he did it with impunity. You know, he mocked these guys, the dudes who put in the carpeting at Taj Mahal, the guys who put in the brass railing and stuff. He stiffed them. You know, these tradesmen, these hardworking family men, and you know how it is, they're buying the materials on credit, you know, to do the job. And then they're sending in a purchase order and that's their profit that they're going to eat off of and put their kids through school with. And he stiffed those guys one after another. And then he would sue them when they went after him and they'd, he'd pay pennies on the dollar. Yeah. You know? And, you know, the people that are there, when I was back in Jersey, I cannot believe the amount of people in my hometown that, that are still supporting this guy. And it's, and it's like they don't know the history. It's, it's almost like reading about only like 65 percent of people between 18 and 24 don't even know the Holocaust happened, which was a mind boggler the other day, which I'm sure we have to educate the world. I mean, it's unbelievable what they're trying to do. And then Trump with this policy, the 1619 thing he's trying to come out with. I know. It's horrifying. The 1619, well, he's trying to be anti 1619. And he name checked Howard Zinn. You know, Howard Zinn, like, you know, Eddie Vedder talks about him, a people's history of the United States. 
is not a leftist document. The thing is written in actual facts. It's written with historical quotes from the people who lived through those times. It's the true history of the United States, but it doesn't, it, it's always been something that's feared on the, on, the, on the right because what it basically does is like, it says that, you know, a lot of this country was set up on like, don't let the people who don't have a lot find out that like the wealthy 1%, basically back then it wasn't 1%, but don't, don't let them find out that the landowners are screwing them, make sort of the poor whites and immigrants think that it's the blacks that are keeping them down. You know, it's an ancient kind of thing where it's like, get people who aren't getting ahead and get them to resent someone beneath them. Don't get them to look above them, you know, and, and that's Trump's thing in a nutshell. He's turned it into this cultural thing, like where I'm your hero, you know, it's the, you know, it's the Mexicans that are stealing your jobs and coming to, you know, hurt you. It's all BS, you know, anybody knows it, but you, when you, when you prey upon sort of vulnerable populations, it, it becomes hard to defend against, you know, and he's, he's selling a lifestyle brand. You said it well, like people in Jersey support him, you know, people that, He's going to screw those people over first. You know, there's people lining up in Minnesota right now to see him tonight, not wearing a mask in an indoor airplane hangar. Like they they could die to hear this guy who doesn't care about him. And can I say one more thing? You talked about Atlantic City. The last time I was there, we were on a Crosby, Stills and Nash tour and Stills and I, we did a show in Chicago at the Chicago theater and the band, everybody else was going to stay there and fly. Stills wanted to take the bus. Atlantic City, which is just, he's insane like that. He was happier on the bus on a 17 hour drive than he was in airports and all that, you know? And I'm like, ah, I'm his road manager. I got to go with him, you know? So me, him and the bus driver leave the nice Ritz in Chicago and get on this like cross country bus ride. And we get off and we were staying at the, uh, what's the one that's named after the Romans? Uh, Caesars. The Caesars, right? So we get off at Caesars, right? We literally get off this bus. It's like one in the afternoon. And next to Caesars is Trump Plaza, which is now shuttered. This is 2015, you know, and this is at the height of Trump running and running, beating all those Republican candidates. And, and I remember looking up at it and I'm like, look, still, you know, look, Steve, there's look, Steve and there's uh, Trump's thing. And he looks at it and like the sign is falling down. It's all black and shuttered, you know, and he's like, that doesn't bode well. You know, it was like a foreshadowing of what this country is going to look like. And look at us now. The country shuttered. You described my neighborhood at the opening about New York City. You know, I've lived on, in the same block for 16 years, Carnegie Hill, a beautiful part of the Upper East Side, you know. And you go there now and it's like uh, half the businesses are shut down, delis, the diners you eat at. We we're becoming that wasteland that Atlantic City, you know, not became because I have a lot of friends who live there and there's some great people, as you know, in South Jersey, you know? Yes, of course. They don't deserve the way we've been treated, but that's what he does. He bankrupts things and he doesn't just bankrupt things. He breaks things. You know, the guy I saw, the reason I talk about his drug addiction is not that I'm like making a moral judgment on drugs. I, I've done a, from plenty of drugs, you know? <laughs> <laughs> if you can do drugs and do the gig, who am I to say anything? He can't do the gig and he's an active addict. And if you know anything about active addiction, you live in this self-centered fear and resentment and it's all about you, you know, and you become very unmanageable, you know, and very destructive in your relationships and your behavior. And that's who he is. You know, he called a press conference today at two o'clock. He didn't show up till 3.15 because he was on Twitter telling people that the Democrats in Virginia were going to take their guns and kill babies in after, you know, after birth abortions. That's a murder. There's no such thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? But well, he, he, was, he was up playing it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> up playing it. Exactly. But that's who he is. He's just, he's incapable of thinking about anybody for himself. The last thing you want in a leader. You want a leader who's going to think about us, not him, you know? So Mary, Mary just came, she just came in. She's like, Trump's a drug addict? Yep. Long term, decades, decades. And coke and meth is his party time. The Adderall addiction is his maintenance high. He does it when he has to read. That's why you see him sniffing in all the press conferences and stuff. He's been dyslexic since he's a little kid. So a three syllable word freaks him out. So when you see him there, he's just finger reading. You know, he's just phonetically going along. He's not thinking about what he's saying. 
He's not interpreting the words. He's just trying to get through the actual physical mental task of reading. So he would crush the Adderall to feel more in control of that. So is, is this is this why he refused to use like just go up there and wing stuff all the time? And exactly. and then when yesterday when he made fun of Joe Biden reading cue cards and teleprompters, then he's sitting there reading a teleprompter like this. I see the word and I say it like no emotion, didn't know how to connect words yeah. together that he was reading. I was like, what the fuck? Yeah. It's a hooked on phonics exercise. Like literally he can't pronounce three syllable words. So if you hear him, he'll say, he's in Minnesota tonight. He'll say mini Annapolis, right? Cause he can't read mini Annapolis. It's too much for his brain. So they write it out phonetically. They go mini dash Annapolis. They go in dash dust dash tree. That's why he goes industry. You know how he always says industry, right? Like, all those words have to be written out. And that's how it was on The Apprentice. You know, they used cue cards. And if there was a three syllable word, he'd freak out. Like arbitrage was on there one time and he just lost his shit. You know, sorry to curse. And just, literally, because he's incontinent too. So he just <laughs> freaked out. He wears the pens. Like he just, uh, he a uh, total freak out, storms off set, crushes Adderall, comes back, feels more in control. That's why, I mean, and your listeners don't have to believe me. And we're well past this anyway, you know, but. Well, yeah, we're, well, we're, we're well past where this matters because, right. the, and, and, you know, you came out, I mean, you started this as soon as you knew he was running for president, you decided to come out, right? Yeah, in 16. And, 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 and you, you had an NDA. Yep. And you were like, fuck it, I'm just going to come out and tell it anyway. Exactly. And, and guys I know were like, and guys that you know as well, were like, don't do that. Like Mark Burnett's going to sue you because people were talking in October of 16. Like I remember I was doing the New Yorker festival, you know, and people had been talking on Facebook, former directors of the show and, and ADs because people saw worse shit than that on like the beauty pageants, which I was involved with too, you know? So there's people like, remember when he came in the truck and told us to get a close up on her tits and all this kind of stuff, you know? So it was starting to get talked about in social media. Um, Burnett got word of that and said, I'm going to sue anybody who speaks out, right? So Hillary's campaign got in touch with me. I'd worked on Obama's inauguration. A colleague in live TV, you were down there, you know, a colleague in live TV was like, hey, I've seen you like not giving it AF on, you know, on Facebook or whatever, talking about this guy. Do you want to come forward? And I was like, yeah, I'll do whatever you need to do. You know, and I spoke to them on background. They put me in touch with People Magazine. I gave them a whole story on it. It all kind of got brushed under the carpet, though. You know, Hillary's well, like, like, like anything with him. Like right. he said himself, I could kill a man on Fifth Avenue and get away with it. And it doesn't really matter what we know about him. It, exactly. It, it, it exactly. doesn't affect his 36 percent. It affects us 64 percent that care. But the 36 percent that have their minds made up that aren't don't really care how much Adderall he crushes, how many diapers he shits in or what happens to him on a daily basis or how many women he's molested. We had someone else come up two days ago that's pressing charges. Yesterday. Well said. Yesterday, Jeff, a girl said he attacked me at the U.S. Open and I worked on the U.S. Open are actually the VIP box. I did the opening closing ceremonies. You know, they'd have Aretha Franklin sing the anthem or something and they'd give us a box. Our box was always right next to Trump's box. You know, he'd, he'd be in there half of his box, you know, and the box is like all the seats in the, in the Arthur Ashe in the arena part were like Miss Universe contestants and a bunch of other girls, you know? So a girl was there invited to his box. You know, I, she went back to the bathroom, which is, you know, the bathroom is by the door to the hallway. It's kind of like an unlit, like if you were going to try to make a move on somebody, that's where you would do it. You know, so her her story checks out completely. You know, it's a completely legitimate story. It's one of tw over 20 legitimate accusations and it doesn't stick to them. That was a news item yesterday. It wasn't even mentioned today. I didn't even see it mentioned once, you know, and I'll say one more thing about the sexual assault. You know, uh, E. Jean Carroll, right, you know, says he raped her, you know, in a, in a, in the Bergdorf Goodman, you know, in a dressing room. I believe her, you know, I know Eugene, I believe her, but think about this. He was famous at the time. And so was she, you know, she was a columnist for like L or one of those magazines. She was a, you know, like a advice columnist, right? 
think about your pathology to like, I'm going to rape this woman who's famous, who knows who I am in a department store. You know, not in a dark alley with a ski mask on, you know, like she knows who I am. I'm going to do it right in the dressing room and I'm going to get away with it. And if you read her description, it completely checks out. It is who the guy is down to his contrarian syndrome. You know, he has oppositional defiance disorder. If you say like the sky's blue, he's got to tell you it's red. It's just some kind of weird tick. And in her story, she talks about like, he sort of buttered her up for lack of a better term by saying, I got to pick out something from my secretary. And they're walking around Bergdorf and she's like, how about this scarf? Nice Hermes scarf or something. He'd be like, no, that's ugly. You know, the little, the little like language ticks are why I believe as accusers and also because of who I saw, <laughs> you know, like. Right. Well, the, the, the big thing about that story is that he got the attorney general to defend him when it should be Jay Secular. Absolutely. And that's why we're in trouble, Jeff. And that's why what just happened just compounded the woes for this nation because Barr was all in yesterday. He basically, if you saw his speech that he gave, he was basically like slumped in his chair and like, he's like, who's going to stop me? You know, when, when Nancy Pelosi tried to basically censure him a couple years ago and they, they saw each other at the policeman's memorial in DC, he goes, did you bring your handcuffs? You know, he knows he's unstoppable and he's dangerous. You know, Trump is a madman, but he's not clever. You know, Barr is not stupid. And Barr is bending the Justice Department to the will of his corrupt boss and his own corrupt motives, uh, which are for power. You know, it's unbelievable. Everybody falls in line with this guy just for that for that ego. They know it's wrong. If in right. any other scenario, this would be a hundred percent wrong, but they fall in line because they're a part of it. And yeah, I don't know. I don't know what, what's bar get out of. Is he going to be rich at the end of this? Yeah. Well, he gets to be powerful. I think they're all in at this point because there's nothing on the other side. They know if they lose, we're coming after these dudes, you know, not in a vengeful way, but like they're going to be. Oh no, no. An eventual way. The SDNY is all over. Uh, Trump. And I heard some of the cases might even go before the election. They might start some of these cases. So he's got like six cases, I think, or something like that with the SDNY that are, they're just ready to start. So there's definitely things. Eric Trump's got to come up and before the election. I saw that yesterday. I mean, they're all going to be pulled up. No, you're uh, right. And, and just an aside, you heard what Eric Trump said, right? He goes, yeah, I'll give you a deposition, but after the election. Right. Meaning got, what? He's going to leave town if his dad well, loses. It's like, yeah, I'll, I'll give you a breathalyzer officer after I drive home and sleep it off. You know what I mean? Like, you don't get to call that shot, but that's that oppositional defiance and that arrogance. Like, yeah, well, they, it's going across the board. Everybody in his organization and everybody that's on his side politically is not obeying Congress. Look at what happened with the HHS. They wanted to bring, or is it DHS? What, who is the guy? The guy they wanted to DHS, bring in, and he yeah, said, Chad Wolf. Yeah, they, yeah, they wanted to bring him up, and he's like, "I'm not going to obey the subpoena." I mean, they didn't enforce the subpoenas uh, eight, eleven months ago when they were doing the impeachment, and they're not enforcing them now. That gives them no bite. I mean, you have to arrest these people. What's the problem? I know, and we didn't. You know, we didn't. They should have. Everybody in the White House who defied subpoenas during the impeachment inquiry, we should have put some teeth into those subpoenas, and they didn't. That's on us. You know, because now we have the situation we have now. If Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi had been like, no, there's a jail in the Capitol and you're in, you know, you're in defiance of a congressional subpoena. We're going to arrest you. You know, we're going to throw you in there until you cooperate. They didn't. And once you do something like that with with Trump and with these kind of corrupt cronies, you're screwed because because his whole motto has basically been like, screw you, stop me. You know, who's going to make me do it? Like the guy hasn't paid taxes, you know, like if you're giving his, give his tax returns. Exactly. The perfect example. There you go. The guy's just like, yeah, I'll show you my tax returns. Blow me. <laughs> you know, and he, who did he put in charge of the treasury? You know, Stephen Mnuchin. And the first thing Stephen did was take where his tax returns are and put them on like a, a separate kind of server that like 10 people have access to. You know, so the first move he made as Secretary of Treasury was helping protect Trump. Well, he knew right. he had to protect the boss if he wanted to keep his job. Right. And you made a good point. Like, why did they go along with him? 
because it's they're setting up like what Putin has, you know, where one guy has consolidated power and he picks a bunch of like oligarchs to be like the other rich dudes in this. Well, country. I can't understand why anyone in American politics, that's their fucking goal. I, I mean, know. it just it escapes my uh, comprehension that their goal is to turn us into Russia and to have everybody under their thumb. I don't get this. Since when was that the goal of our American political system? I understand. I know. I mean, was it the goal before four years ago, you think? No, I don't. But I think I think the groundwork was laid. You know, the Russians have been pumping money into D.C. for 20 years. They've been buying a bunch of lobbying firms and spreading a lot of cash around. A guy like Mitch McConnell always wanted to be wealthy. You know, I host a podcast. We had James Carville on there, you know, and a guy named Oleg Derek Pot, or I used to anyway, a guy named Eric. Uh, Oleg Deripaska started pumping money into Kentucky, you know, funding all these coal mines, you know, so McConnell's getting kickbacks on that. He's getting political deliverables to his constituents. You know, they're finding a way to like find the avarice in these people and give them an opportunity to consolidate and hold on to their power. And if you're greedy, that's irresistible, you know, and especially if you're doing it to an electorate that's going to buy the BS, the flag waving and the we're on your side and stuff. You know, that's where the danger is. Like you said, you know, th that speech yesterday about patriotic education should horrify, you know, every American because we're, 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 we're a nation of like individuals, you know, rugged individualism used to be our creed and especially in the GOP. You know, and it's not. They're falling no, in now, now everybody wants to be on a team and wave a flag like I've never seen. They've turned politics into football. In and I, 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 unbelievable. Like, here, you got to wear my hat and you got to wave, wave my flag and you got to put it on your boat. And you got to, you know, I went down to beach this summer in Atlantic City in Margate and there was a, a Trump flag and a Biden flag down there on the beach. And I'm like, since when do people care about politics on the freaking beach? I didn't come here to see Trump flags, but this is what people think is important. They've accepted it like they support the New York Giants or the um, 76ers or whatever it is. They, that This is your team, your right. team Trump. But it, you know why, Noel? It's because they took all the money out of education in our country and they put it in the military and they put it in our police and they put it in our prison system to keep them full, the privatized prisons, with slaves. It's unbel. It is. If I had hair, I'd pull it all out. I can't believe you have any hair left. <laughs> well, I couldn't have said that better myself. You know, you're absolutely right. That's what they did. And there was a reason like Reagan and people started defunding arts education. You know, you defund the humanities, you 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 rob a people of a chance to know their own humanity and to know empathy for their fellow man. You know, a lot of what I know about in life, I've learned from songwriters. You know, I've learned from Springsteen. I've learned from going to a dead show and being in an arena with 20,000 other people and moving as one to a common vibe, you know, to a tribe feeling, you know. So, and you, you, I've also learned to think for myself. You know, I've learned to not accept what somebody tells me and to, to question their motives. So if you take that out, but you replace it with a false tribal sense like you said it's like patriots giants people didn't have reagan flags or 15 of them on their boat you know like you said these people have these it's a he sold them a lifestyle brand you know well, and that's, that's what he's always been good at selling trump and then selling the republicans like it's part of it like the presidency's part of his organization which it is they fill their his hotels they use his golf courses they have to use what he says they use and he can build them whatever he wants i mean we're in a conundrum and nothing works any of the oversights that we had where you can't you know what is it called uh when you're not allowed to use what's what is it Checks and balances. Emoluments. When you're not allowed to use um, your your companies to make money while right. you're president, he's not allowed to make money, right? Yeah, that's an emoluments violation. Right, emoluments violation. Right. Full of those hatch violations. The hatch, unbelievable. Putting the Republican convention on the on the lawn of the White House. I mean, come on, he's campaigning from the people's house. Exactly, dude. They they renovated the Rose Garden for that crane shot of them walking in. There was no other reason to renovate it. They did it because they knew they were going to have the convention there and they wanted to run a dolly down a concrete strip so they could get a long shot of Melania walking in for her speech the night before. Nobody would ever even think of doing a political speech from the White House, let alone packaging it as a TV show.
And yeah. as a convention. Right, a, a convention. And like you said, the emoluments, David Fahrenholt, who stays on him about that, a Washington, great Washington Post reporter, they just found out today that they that the Secret Service had been renting a cottage in rooms at Bedminster, six fifty a night for the rooms, seventeen thousand a month for the cottage since March, since everything was shut down in the pandemic, just in case he went there because he went to his property so much they basically didn't want to have to move out and like re-clean the room or whatever, so they just kept it. So he's been built, and that was like a million point one, you know a million dollars, you know, a million dollars, a hundred thousand of taxpayer money that he took since March, since the rest of us have been like without a job or a paycheck. I mean, you're from Jersey, like Bedminster might be a nice club, but you think it's 17,000 a month for, because that's the other thing he's overcharging the people. Right. You know, it's not, it's not like, you know, Amagansett, you well, know they, what I mean? They had that in the um, uh, inauguration. They, yeah. they've discovered that, right? That he was charging two times or three times more for the ballroom than they did when anybody else used it. Exactly. He jacks up the, 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 you know, the price and, and you worked on inaugurations. You've been down there. I did two of them. Like they, there's like still like eighty ninety thousand dollars missing, missing from the inaugural fund. Obama's first inauguration, I think it was 30 or $40 million. I did the big ball. We had Beyonce, we had Springsteen, U2, like you name it. We had A-list talent and like the dead played. They played the, the, the ball downstairs. Like we had everybody in the convention center and it was 30, $40 million. He had three doors down and a marching band. And he claims that they spent $90 million. You know what I mean? That nobody can find. And so it's a grift. That's what it's always been. Let me and that, that's one of the things SDNY is uh, putting them up on too, right? And, you know, Trump Tower, like the one on Fifth Avenue, when he became president, they basically like the DOD, Department of Defense, realized they had to rent an apartment in Trump Tower because they, they have the nuclear football. So if he was going to spend the night there, they needed a secure apartment. So like the dude who carries that briefcase can be within you know, whatever, how many steps of him you need to be in case something goes down in the middle of the night, right? So that's an apartment that I think they rented half a floor at Trump Tower. The rate of that would have been like, to be generous, say it's $20,000 a month. Trump, Trump charged them 119000 a month for the space. So Secret Service learned about that and they're like, no, you're not jerking us because they were going to get another place and they moved down onto 56th Street. That's why they're in a trailer and they closed off the street because Secret Service is like, you're not jacking us that way. We'll just stay in the trailer to protect you. But that's that's a good insight into who he is. You know, most people, they became president. They'd be like, what an honor. I'm going to let them have it at market rate or just give it to them. He jacks off or jacks up the price on his own government. Jacks off too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a for football, you know, but it's all a scam, you know. It's all scam. And, you know, I read a very interesting thing. I mean, I saw a tweet and it scared the fuck out of me. And it was basically, you know what? Even if Biden wins, Trump's not going anywhere. He'll be on Twitter every day up his ass. These uh, these people that that these boogaloos and all these sub splintered racist groups aren't going to go anywhere. They're going to increase. They're going to increase their uh, presence on the streets. They're going to you know, it's, it's still going to be America's still going to be a shit show. There's a lot to climb out of. So it, it's not he's really, you know, at the end of Idiocracy. You remember the movie, right? Yep. I've never seen a movie call a presidential call a future so well before. And then Mike judges idiocracy. Yeah. And in that movie, the, everything goes to hell because a reality, a wrestler becomes president. Yep. And yes, here, David DeWitt right here, martial law. I mean, th this is kind of where we're headed as a country. And it scares the hell out of me. And I'm sure it scares the hell of a lot of people. And people are leaving the cities. You see what's happening in New York. You're, you still have your place in New York, though, right? In the city. I do. So, but I don't, I don't, you know, I don't know for how much longer because we, we stay up here, you know? Yeah. Because, and you're right, he's not going anywhere. And I've been telling people this, like when you see these people in their big pickup trucks and all their MAGA NRA stuff, he's like building an army. You know, they're not going to give that up overnight. If Biden wins, like you said, they're not going to wake up tomorrow. We're like, well, let me get behind Biden. It's too much fun feeling like you're fighting for a cause, you know, and that's what he's appealed to. We see these guys militarized, you know, over wearing a mask 
they stormed the Capitol in, in Detroit, in Michigan, because they didn't want to get a mask and they were mad they couldn't get a haircut. That was in like April. Yeah. You know what I mean? So you're right. It's not going away. And he, he'll like nothing more than to keep sowing chaos because that's what I said earlier. That's what he does. He breaks things. He's, he's almost more interested in just being the center of att attention and destruction than he is in like making a lot of money and stuff. Like even though he's obviously grifting, most people who had as much money as he does would have disappeared. You know, I'd be down on an island or something somewhere. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I wouldn't want he's anything. Down on, down on Jeffrey Epstein's island is probably where he wanted to be. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But they, they keep wiping out everybody. People keep dying mysteriously that have any kind of evidence. Nobody seems to investigate it. I mean, I can't believe Jeffrey Epstein got murdered. And it just kind of fell apart. Nobody followed it up. Here's a mult, one of the richest guys in the world gets murdered in a prison with guards everywhere. Exactly. Not to, in, in Manhattan Correctional Center, which is where they keep like El Chapo. You know, it's where they keep like the, you know, use, you know, the guy who bombed the first trade center bombing. It's right. not like Mayberry town jail. Right. You know what I mean? It's the kind of place where two guards and two cameras, you know, two guards fall asleep, two cameras all of a sudden mysteriously stop working, you know, with the guy who's got a safe full of compromise. And by the way, that was Bill Barr and Bill Barr raided the Island a week later and raided you know, Jeffrey Epstein's mansion on 71st Street, which is right down the street from where I live. I live right off of Fifth Avenue. He lived right off Fifth Avenue. I would see Jeffrey. You would see Jelaine. You might not remember, but she would come to Rock Hall with Naomi Campbell back when we used to do it at the Waldorf. She was always there. So uh, I'm not trying to pin you on that. But no, no, no. Hey, listen, I don't, I don't read, I didn't recognize her, but someone else brought her name up too. And what's interesting is that she uh, kind of just disappeared. You don't exactly. hear it. She's, she's not dead. But if I was her, I would have definitely sent some tapes out. Absolutely. I mean, that's the only way to stay alive, right? Right. Because Barr, like, you know, I was in Jersey when they killed him or whatever. And I was like, oh, my God. Like, because the case was closed. And you've never seen that evidence. And Barr said yesterday in his speech, the FBI worked for me. He literally quoted, you know, he's quoted saying, who do you think you answer to? Whose force do you think you are? So he was saying he has control over the cops. And we saw what the protesters this summer. You know, they're gassing protesters, in, you know, in Lafayette Park. And it came out this week. They wanted to use a heat ray gun. Yeah, I saw that. It's like insane. So, and, and they also came out this week that they didn't give them any kind of warning to tell them that they wanted them to clear the right. park. Exactly. They just went in there because they wanted to do a show of force. You know, they wanted to, you know... It's scary, but they wanted to foreshadow what might go down in six weeks on an election. And they want people to kind of be like, you know what? It ain't worth it. You know, I don't want or, you know, people to tell their kids, like, stay in, sweetie. I know you believe in this, but I don't want to see you on the news getting, you know, dragged through a park. You well, know, not, not even dragged in, but they're now charging people with fucking sedition, which is like 20 years in jail for going and protesting at these these things and getting busted. They want to put people in jail for 10, 20 years. I know. Serious charges. They're bringing serious charges. And Barr wanted to charge the mayor of Seattle for the protest zone. He still is. He's trying to go after her. It's it's scary, you know. And it's, it's everything, like, that we grew up listening to all that classic rock in the 60s. You know, I'm friends with a lot of those guys. I worked with Neil Young, Nash, all those guys. They're like, that was child's play. Like, you know, oh, absolutely. That, well, it was child's play. It was very violent. You saw some of that this summer in Philly. They were swinging the billy clubs like crazy. In Minnesota, they're swinging the billy clubs like crazy. You know, let me ask you, Noel, what does the future hold? I think we're going to survive this. You know, I believe in the American people. I think we're going to go through some tough times. I think we need all hands on deck. I think everybody needs to show up and vote. And I think especially with this RBG situation you know rest her soul so the future holds hope but we're gonna have to fight for it you can't and i don't mean fight violent i mean you're gonna have to stand up for your rights and protect your rights and protect your brothers and sisters and especially women because you know because they're stuck in the supreme court as you know fundamentalist christian men that don't care about you know a woman's right to choose <laughs>
They don't care about women at all. I've never seen anything like it. I can't believe we've gone so far backwards in our world. We were so far progressed with race, or at least we seem to be. We were so far progressed with women's rights, or at least we seem to be. We were so far progressive with like trying to care about the homeless and those less fortunate than us, or at least we seemed to be. But now it seems like everybody retreated to their corners and wants to hold on to what's theirs. Most of the people that I know that are voting for Trump are very concerned about losing what they have. It's a very egotistical time. Everybody's very concerned about themselves. And you should be about yourself and your money and stuff like that. But I think there's a bigger picture here that people are missing besides with their own bank account. And that is the moral bank account that's out there, the ethical bank account that is part of your bank account. I mean, it's just as valuable, if not more than money are your ethics and what you stand for, because you either stand for something or you'll you'll fall for anything. Well said, brother. Well said. I'm done. Should... I'm done falling, dude. Yeah, exactly. And you know what? You made a great point in there. You can have all the money in the world. Like if you can't live in a happy society, you know, those those northern European countries, they figured it out. You go to places like Sweden and, you know, Norway. I've traveled in all those countries. Like the poorest person there is taken care of because the richest people know that like it's not that fun living in a nice place when you have to step over somebody sleeping in the street. You know what I mean? It ruins your vibe. So you're like, hey, dude, get up. We're going to give you a house. We're going to give you an education. We're going to help you. We're going to give you health care, you know, so I can go enjoy what I have. And they're not suffering over there. People are still incredibly wealthy, you know, but they're taking care of everybody. In America, we've gotten past that. You know, we've got this 1% and some people have everything and screw the other guy. And that doesn't work because we're all connected. You know, whether we like it or not, we're all part of this. You know, we're two hands on the same body, you know. So who are you voting for? I'm <laughs> I think I'm not going to Trump another chance. <laughs> yeah, I'm voting for Biden. Okay. I just wanted to hear you say it. I'm saying the same thing. I'm also voting for Joe Biden. And I suggest everybody out there does the same thing. We need a change in this country. And we need it fast. Absolutely. And we need to vote down ballot, too. And it's like there's been some good ads lately. This is this is. That's not the GOP. I got family that are conservative. That's not your dad's Republican Party anymore. You know, no. The, the, no, in all my life, I've never seen Republicans for the Democratic candidate. Republicans for Biden. I was like, what a mind blower this is. And I don't care who's in there or how long they were in office or how long ago. The fact that you are a lifelong Republican and realize how bad our country is right now, that you need to switch your vote to Joe Biden. Well, God bless you. And I hope a lot of other people follow. Noel, thank you so much for coming on. Do you have any last thoughts you want to tell anybody or you want to plug anything before I let you go? No, that's it, man. I love talking to you, Jeff. Keep up the fight. And uh, yeah, your friends can follow me on Twitter. I'm easy to find. And just get out there and vote. You know, it, it matters now more than ever. You know, God bless. You know? Thank you. Thank you, Noel. You have good and say hi to your lady up there. And I look forward to playing some guitar with you soon. You got it, brother. All right. Take care. Noel Castler right there, legend. I mean, today we got into it. Um, who, who's running independent? Yeah, uh, I think Kanye. Kanye is the uh, is supposed to be the vibe killer in that one. Uh, the lunatics are running the asylum. Everybody out there, Happy New Year once again. I want you all to have a great weekend. I want to thank Noel Castle for coming on. Please follow him on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, he's a hilarious guy and smart, plugged in, tuned in, and had a front row seat to what went down and was nice enough to, to not care about the legal implications coming at him. But one thing I read about it was if they went after him and sued him, then they have to take it on the court and then the people might come out and say, hey, he's right. This is real. So uh, everybody have a great weekend. Peace, love, happiness, everybody out there. A big hug, a big, big hug. Um, I had so many other things I wanted to talk about, but, uh, you know, time's short. We got to go. Thanks, Noel. Thank you, everybody out there. So, R R RBJ, rest in peace. I was thinking about you today and I was saying, wow, this lady is going to hold off to the election. I literally had that thought today when I was leaving for lunch. I was thinking she was in my head. And uh, I think that must have been around the time maybe she left even because we're in the middle of the show. That's the first time that's happened. We had a big story break. 
I know people were like, you should cut away, but you know what? I'm here. This show is going to live on forever. And I definitely wanted to finish that conversation with Noel. It was very good. RBG's dead. There's not much more that's going to happen with that story, except who's going to replace her. So let's get our best people on a job. Have a great week.